Well, let's see. Now I'm going to tell you about a rather more substantial variation. Uh, one that's a, a famous variation that uh, many early lists uh, had. It's called dynamic binding of variables. And we'll investigate a little bit about that right now. I'm going to first introduce this by showing you the sort of thing that would make someone want this idea. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. I'm going to show you, how you why you might want it. Suppose, for example, we looked at the sum procedure again for summing up a bunch of things to be that procedure of a term, a, low, a lower bound, a method of computing the next index, and upper bound such that if A is greater than B, then the result is 0. Otherwise, it's the sum of the term procedure applied to A and the result of adding up terms um, with the <coughs> next A being the A. the next procedure passed along and the upper bound being passed along. Blink, blink, blink. Okay. Now, when I use this sum procedure, I can use it, for example, like this. We can define the sum of the powers of to be, for example, sum of a bunch of powers x to the n to be that procedure of a, b, and n, lower bound, the upper bound, and n, which is sum of lambda of x, that procedure of one argument x, which exponentiates x to the n. With the A, the incrementer, and B being passed along. So we're adding up x to the n, given an x. x takes on values from A to B, incrementing by 1. I can also write the. the that's right. It's product, excuse me a product of a bunch of powers. It's a strange name. I'm going to leave it there. Weird. OK? I'll write what I have. I'm sure that's right. And if I want the product of a bunch of powers, that was 12 brain cells. That double take. Okay, I can, for example, use the the procedure which is like sum, which is for making products, but it's similar to that that you've seen before. It has a procedure of of three arguments again, which is the product of terms that are constructed or factors in this case, constructed from exponentiating x to the n, where I start with a, I increment, and I go to b. Now, <clears throat> there's some sort of thing here that should disturb you immediately. These look the same. Why am I writing this code so many times? Okay, here I am in the same, in the same boat I've been in before. Right? Wouldn't it be nice to make an abstraction here? What's an example of a good abstraction to make? Well, I see some code that's identical. Here's one, and here's another. Okay. And so maybe I should be able to pull that out. I should be able to say, oh yes, 
The sum of the powers could be written in terms of something called the nth power procedure. I imagine somebody wanted to write a slightly different procedure that looks like this. <clears throat> The sum powers to be a procedure of A, B, and N, which is the result of summing up the nth power. We're going to give a name to that idea. For starting at A, going by 1, and ending at B. <clears throat> and similarly, And I might want to write product powers this way, abstracting out this idea. I might want this. Product powers. To be a procedure of A, B, and N, which is the product of the nth power operation on A with the incrementation and B being being my arguments for the analogous thing product. And I'd like to be able to define I'd like to be able to define nth power I'll put it over here Put it at the top. To be, in fact, my procedure of one argument x, which is the result of exponentiating x to the n. But I have a problem. My environment model that is my means of interpretation for the language that we've defined so far does not give me a meaning for this n. Because, as you know, the, as you know, this n is free in this procedure. The environment model tells us that the meaning of a free variable is determined in the environment in which this procedure is defined. In the way I've written it, assuming these things are defined on the blackboard as is, this is defined in the global environment where there is no n. Therefore, n is an unbound variable. But it's perfectly clear to most of us that we would like it to be this n and this n. Okay. On the other hand, Okay, it would be nice, certainly we've got to be careful here of keeping this to be this. Okay. And this one over here, wherever it is, to be this one. Well, the desire to make this work has led to a very famous bug. Okay. I'll tell you about the famous bug. If you look at this slide is an idea called dynamic binding, where instead of the free variable being interpreted in the environment of definition of a procedure, the free variable is interpreted as having its value in the environment of the caller of the procedure. And so what you have is a system where you search up the chain of callers of a particular procedure and of course, in this case, since nth power is called from inside product, whatever it is, I didn't write, I wrote sum, which is the analogous procedure, okay? And product is presumably called from product powers, as you see over here, then since product powers bind the variable n, then nth powers n would be derived through that chain. Okay. Similarly, this n, the nth power in n, in this case, would come through nth power here being called from inside sum. You can see being called from inside sum here. Okay. 
it's called term here. Okay, but sum was called from inside of some powers which bound n. Therefore, there would be an n available for that n to be to get its value from. This is called a dynamic. What we have below this white line, plus over here, is what's called a dynamic binding view of the world. If that works, that's a dynamic binding view. Now let's take a look, for example, at just what it takes to implement that. That's real easy. In fact, the very first LISPs that had any from interpretation for the free variables at all had dynamic binding interpretations for the free variables. APL has dynamic binding interpretation for the free variables. Not, not, not lexical or static binding. So the, of course the change is in eval. Okay. And it's really in two places. First of all, one thing we see is that things become a little simpler. If I don't have to have the if I don't have to have the environment be the environment of definition for a procedure, the procedure need not capture the environment at the time it's defined. And so if we look here at this, this slide, we see that the clause for a lambda expression, which is the way a procedure is defined, does not make up a thing which has a type closure and an and a, uh, attached environment structure. It's just the expression itself, and we'll decompose that some other way somewhere else. Okay. The other thing we see is the applicator, the applicator must be able to get the environment of the caller. The caller of a procedure is right here. If the procedure is an application, if, if the expression we're evaluating is an application, then we're going to call, or a combination, then we're going to call a procedure which is the value of the operator. The environment of the caller is the environment we have right here, available now. So all I have to do is pass that environment to the applicator to apply. And if we look at that here, the only change we have to make is that the, that fellow takes that environment and uses that environment for the purpose of extending that environment when, ab when abiding the formal parameters of the procedure to the arguments that were passed. Not, a not an environment that was captured in the procedure. The reason why the first lists were implemented this way is it's sort of the obvious accidental implementation. And of course, as usual, people got used to it and liked it. And there were some people who said, this is the way to do it. Right? Unfortunately, that causes some serious problems. The most important serious problem in using dynamic binding is that there's a modularity crisis that's involved in it. If two people are working together on some big system, then an important thing to want is that the names used by each one don't interfere with the names of the other. It's important that when I invent some segment of code, that no one can make my code stop working by using my names that I use internal to my code, internal to his code. However, dynamic binding violates that particular modularity constraint in a clear way. Consider, for example, what happens over here. <clears throat> Suppose it was the case that I decided to change the word next. I mean, I'm supposing somebody is writing, somebody is writing sum, and somebody else is going to use sum. The writer of sum has a choice of what names he may use. Let's say I'm that writer. Well, by gosh, it just happens I didn't want to call this next, I called it n. Okay? So all places where you see next, I called it n. Oops. I've changed nothing about the specifications of this program. But this program stops working. Not only that, unfortunately, this one does too. Okay, why do these programs stop working? Well, it's sort of clear. Instead of chasing out the, instead of chasing out the value of the n that occurs in nth power over here or over here, through the environment of definition, where this one is always linked to this one, 
if it were through the environment of definition, because here is the definition. This lambda expression was executed in the environment where that end was defined. Okay. If instead of doing that, I have to chase through the call chain, then look what horrible thing happens. Well, this was called from inside sum as term, term A. Okay. I'm looking for a value of n. Instead of getting this one, I get that one. So by changing the insides of this program, this program stops working. So I no longer have a quantifier, as I described before, which is a symbol, it's a lambda symbol, is supposed to be a quantifier, a thing which has the property that the, that the names that are, that are bound by it are unimportant, that I can uniformly substitute any names for these throughout this thing, so long as they don't occur in here, the new names, and the meaning of this expression should remain unchanged. I've just changed the meaning of the expression by changing the na one of the names. So lambda is no longer a well-defined idea. It's a very serious problem. So for that reason, I and my buddies have given up this particular kind of abstraction, which I would like to have, in favor of a modularity principle. But this is the kind of experiment you can do if you want to play with these interpreters. You can try them out this way, that way, and the other way. Okay, and you see what makes a nicer language. So that's a very important thing to be able to do. Now, I would like to give you a feeling for what I think the right thing to do is here. How are you going to, how are you going to uh, get this kind of, of power in a lexical system? And the answer is, of course, what I really want is something that makes up for me an exponentiator for a particular n. Given an n, it will make me an exponentiator. Oh, but that's easy, too. In other words, I could write my power by program this way. And define a thing called pgen, which is a procedure of n which produces for me an exponentiator. x to the n. Given that I have that, then I can capture the abstraction I wanted, even better, because it's now encapsulated in a way where I can't be destroyed by a change of names. I can define some powers to be a procedure again of a, b, and n, which is the sum of the term, genera the term function generated by using this generator, p gen n, okay, with a, the incrementer, and b. And I could define the product of powers to be a procedure of a, b, and n, which is the product of p gen n with a increment and b. Now, of course, this is a very simple example where this object that I'm trying to abstract over is small. But it could be 100 lines of code. And so the purpose of this is, of course, to make it simple. I've given a name to it. It's just that here it's a parameterized name. It's a name that depends upon explicitly the lexically apparent value of n. So you can think of this as a long name. And here I've solved my problem by naming, my, 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 by naming the, the term generation procedures with an n in them. Are there any questions? Oh, yes. David. Is the only solution to uh, uh, the problem you raised to create another procedure? In other words, can this only work in languages that are capable of defining objects as procedures? Oh, I see. The, my solution to making this abstraction, 
when I didn't want to include the procedure inside the body, depended upon my ability to return a procedure or, or export one. Right. And that's right. Uh, in the, if I don't have that, then I just don't have this ability to make an abstraction in a way where I don't have, uh, where I, where I don't have possibilities of symbol conflicts that were unanticipated. That's right. So one of the, the I, consider, I consider being able to return a procedural value and therefore, uh, and therefore to sort of have first class procedures in general as being essential to doing very good modular programming. Now indeed, there are many other ways to skin this cat. What you can do is take, for each of the, for each of the bad things that you have to worry about, you can make a special feature that covers that, that thing. You can make a package system. You can make a module system, as in ADA, et cetera. Okay? And all of those work over, they cover little regions of it. The thing is that returning procedures as values cover all of those problems. Okay? And so it's the simplest mechanism that gives you the, that gives you the best modularity. It gives you all of the known modularity mechanisms. Well, I suppose it's time for the next break. Thank you.